So today is our last lecture and I just want to thank you for choosing this biomarkers special topic. I hope that you've enjoyed it and that you've maybe learned something. And um, yeah, I'm going to miss seeing you guys every now and then. If you guys ever have any questions or you want to pop me an email, please do so. Like, I really like hearing from you guys and it's nice to increase collaborations between different universities, I think, because we all have kind of similar goals and interests. So today's biomarkers kind of case study that we're going to do, I'm hoping it's going to be more interactive. I've printed all your names, so I will just draw it out randomly so that you guys each have a section that you can explain and go through. But like, don't worry, it's not like a serious thing. It's more like you just get a participation mark, so it's not a big deal. Um, yeah, so let's get started. I hope that everyone enjoyed the paper. I think it was quite a nice follow-on from our gene expression assay because it kind of runs through like this biomarker discovery and validation and it had a bit of machine learning type of algorithm setting um, in it. So this study was quite a large scale study that was done in collaboration with quite a lot of... Um, did you message me to go? Okay. Feel better? Um, it, it had quite a few sites, so it had the Gambia, it had South Africa, it had international collaborators that all worked to discover this new signature for predicting tuberculosis risk. And it was, it was published in The Lancet, which has a very high impact factor of 53, which is extremely high. Um, yeah, so let's get started on that. So I will go through the introduction, and I've prepared slides so that you guys don't feel like you're just presenting alone and you just have to explain the paper by yourselves. Uh, hopefully they're helpful, so don't worry if you feel, is it print, is it? Your face is good. What if we do this? It's like much harder because we're all going to be talking. So just to start us off in an introduction, tuberculosis, if you guys don't know, it is quite a prevalent disease. It's becoming more and more of a problem. So I work with TB and a lot of people are always saying, like, is TB still a problem? Like, I can't believe people start TB, but it is very much a problem. It is spreading. We are getting multi-drug resistant TB. We had our first case in, in Cape Town of uh, totally drug resistant TB. So it was multi-drug resistant, then extensively drug resistant, and now we're on totally drug resistant TB, which is quite scary. And so this infection, and it is really becoming an epidemic, and it is starting to spread really all over the world. And one of the problems with TB, I don't know if you know this, but mycobacteria and tuberculosis, the bacteria itself, is actually quite an interesting pathogen because it's able to establish what we know as a latent infection. So it becomes dormant, so it infects the cells in your lungs, and it's able to arrest the phagosome from fusing to the lysosome and kind of stays hidden inside your macrophages so that the immune system can't really see it. And it just stays there dormant for years. So a lot of us have actually come into contact with TB and have this latent infection and no one really knows that they have it. You can do certain tests to tell if your immune system has seen it. And the problem with latent infection is that it can go on to relapse at a later stage in your life. So if you become immunocompromised, as you age, if you take you know, things like steroids or anti-inflammatories, it can cause this bacteria to start replicating and causing active TB. So they've estimated that a third of the global population is latently infected with TB. There is some fighting about these exact numbers, but it's quite a large proportion of patients. So only 10% of those patients are going to go on to develop active TB, and we're not really sure why. There are a bunch of host factors, of course, um, things have, like your age, comorbidities, if you're infected with diabetes, if you have diabetes or you're infected with HIV, can lead you to progress to t tuberculosis. Um, socioeconomic, so if you don't have the best health status, you're not the healthiest, or you smoke, and of course immune suppression is always a problem. So they did a lot of modeling and algorithms to see, like, could we treat everyone that's latently infected to try and kill the bacteria? And it's not financially feasible to treat a third of the global population. It just is not going to have an effect. Well, it would have an effect, but it's just too expensive, essentially. So there have been a lot of studies that are trying to identify how can we figure out who of the latent people are going to go on to, project to progress to active tuberculosis. So that's been a big source of research, and that's what this paper tried to identify. So who wants to run us through the aims of the paper? I'm going to let you be the picker of everyone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess we're missing a few people, but they'll have to come back and explain the harder figures then. So who is it? Are they here? All right, next. This is the easiest one, it's the aims. Right? It's like, it's written up here. 
He's not here. Oh, come on. <laughs> you got the easiest one. Okay, what are the aims of this paper? What were the objectives? Um, okay, so they were trying to discover um, which genes they could use as biomarkers to try to discover people that would be infected with TB uh, from the latent set. So uh, they were trying to find which genes would be best. Uh, I know they found 16 genes that they decided to use as their signature marker for all the genes, and they wanted to obviously try tests uh, how strong it would be a detecting people who would get infected with TB when they were latent and also compare them to people that would slowly start to develop TB over almost like a two year period and all of that. So they're just comparing people that were just going to stay latent with infection versus people who would actually progress into obtaining the disease. Excellent, right? So that was it. They're just finding a gene signature, a host gene signature from the blood to see which patients are going to go on to develop TB. So they got patients who were already latently infected and follow them on for two years. So quite a long study looking at blood-based uh, signature. That was beautiful, thank you. Okay, so this is figure one A. Mm -hmm. Who is going to be lucky figure one A? Look at single. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do it together, guys, don't worry. And people can help. You can I'm pull a brass. Who is it? Myself. <laughs> <laughs> really? Congratulations. Okay. I've kind of <laughs> I've written it out for you, so uh -huh. you kind of just need to follow the thing. So what was figure one A about? Mm -hmm. What are we looking at? And you're welcome to stand up then and talk to us <laughs> if you want. Okay. So what was this? What was the adolescent cohort study? So yeah, okay, let me just... Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the camera. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> switch it off, you don't have to have it on. Okay, tell us. 30 people will see on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, right, I don't think anyone's following this. Okay, tell us about it. <laughs> so, okay. So here, the speaker tells us um, how many people, first picks the number of people that were um, chosen for the study, and then um, after that, so they identified... So, so this was part of the adolescent cohort, so they had this group of individuals. Yeah. What was the defining format of these people? Who did they include in the study? Oh, people. Like people from age 12 to 18. Good, okay. So youngsters, adolescents. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what do we think about having only adolescents? Do you think that's a limitation? I yes. feel like that's a limitation. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Because mm -hmm. there's obviously age factors like is a huge component of something like this. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the time these studies, they have ongoing studies and they kind of you know, piggyback onto these studies so it's what's available. But of course... This is a bias of the study. You're looking at adolescents. But in a way, what would be the benefits of looking at adolescents and not, say, 65-year-olds? <laughs> yeah, okay. We, do, we know we have a lot of uh, youngsters who are infected. I think that's me. Um, also, then perhaps not looking at an age-related factor. So you know that you're not going to have problems of like an older population, and it's good to know who are young population if they're going to progress to TB. All right, so how many adolescents did they look at in this cohort? <laughs> 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 good, good. And then what was the inclusion criteria for putting them into the study? What is QFT and TSD? Anyone want to help there? QFT? Quantiferon? Anyone heard of the Quantiferon test? Has anyone been tested for TB here? No. Oh, you guys should come to our lab. They test us all the time. It's great, actually. So, <laughs> Quantiferon is, a, is a basically an ELISA-based test that looks at interferon gamma release to, uh, in response to MTB antigens. So, they take your blood and they stimulate it overnight, and depending on your interferon gamma response, they can see if you are latently infected or not. It's not very good at differentiating between an active and latent infected person because they'll probably have kind of a similar response. But you can tell someone has never seen TB, which is quite nice. I really encourage you guys to go and find out if you are latently infected. You're welcome to come to our lab. We'll do it for you. So TST is called tuberculin skin test. So they basically make a little kind of like cut in your skin and then they rub essentially antigens into your skin. And depending on how big this response is, if you have seen TB, you'll have quite a large response on your skin. Also not very specific or sensitive. 
But that is how they improve these people. So to quantiferin positive and TST positive patients or people, so they're latently infected, but they have no sign of active TB, right? The chest x-rays are clean. Okay, do you want to carry on with that? And then they did a follow-up after two years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so that's so now we're like getting down into it, and they're, they're telling us out of all those people they screened, only some of them were put into a study, of course, because some people fail. Along the way, we see some developed TB, right? So they were excluded. These guys had TB greater than six months after their TB infection, so they were excluded. So all along the way, we're losing people. So at the end of this, how many TB patients or progressors did we have? Forty-six. Forty-six. And what is TTD? Time to, time to diagnosis. Good, time to diagnosis, mm -hmm. right? So they, they try to keep them within this two-year period. And so they also recruited healthy patients. So why do we need a healthy patient population? Control. Right, as our control population. And so how did they deal with the controls in terms of the signature? What does it mean when they match them, match healthy controls? Right, yeah? Yeah, so they had their healthy population and they tried to match based on age, gender, the schools they were at and everything to try and keep everything so that there's not so many variables. So there was for every one progressor, you had two healthy controls, right? And then they were randomized into training and test set. So what does that mean? What was this part? This, I think I have a slide on that. Training and test. Yeah, who wants to take training and test? Well done. Thank you. You're off the hook. <laughs> Aisha. Yes. Okay. What what is training and test? Why do we need two cohorts or this training and test set? You can if you want, but like try and tell us what you think. So first, they have their training set to develop the RNA signature, right? So they train the model on the cohort, and then they, test then they have a test cohort. So that you're not testing your gene expression signature on the same cohort that you developed it on, right? Otherwise, you're just... Pardon? Cheating. Yeah, essentially you're cheating. So you need to have a new independent cohort that you can train and test your algorithm against. Okay, so that's just the training test. So I said machine learning. <coughs> oh, you guys did this with Dave, so you know it. And then they fit their gene signature to the training set, and then they test it on their testing set. And then they constantly go back to make sure that the gene signatures are fitting with their training set and slightly changing it to make the best signature that would work. Right, so the fitted model is used to predict the response for the observations on the second data set, which is called your test or your validation test. So this is kind of showing you like the entire thing I was talking about, the biomarker pipeline and how they do it. This is a really good example of how to do this. Okay, so this is the validation set, the cohort. So if you want to do 1B, choose a lucky person. <laughs> this is an easy one. <laughs> but now you're done. You don't even have to do the hard one. Okay, tell us about the validation cohort. Um, this was the second cohort that they did where they had the South African and the Gambian people. Yeah, so what do we think about the fact that there's now two sites? Is that good? Bad? Is it good? Why? You have more comparisons that can be done based on area. Exactly. Oftentimes you get something that's very specific to even within lo locally, like in the Western Cape, our patients are quite different to PE patients or Durban patients. So it's quite important to try and get different sites to match or validate your cohort. Okay, thank you. And what's next? How many patients did they get? What were their age graphs? They had a daughter. Yeah. So 10 to 60 years old. So in fact, this is quite nice because they get to see if their adolescent signature really matches a much broader range. But this can also get tricky because you can end up not validating your study because of something like the age gap is so big. But it's quite nice to do it like this because then you're taking into account a more broader population that's more representative of what you would see in the field. Okay, so they went to Gambia and South Africa and they had time points at baseline at the six months and the 18 months where they collected blood. 
And so from South Africa, I'm sorry, I've completely taken over now. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> they have 43 progressors. They have 30 progressors from the Gambia. So quite a nice spread. Seems quite even. And then they had some that fell off of it. And then they had the same matching with the healthy patients. Okay, so that was our validation. Okay, so what was the strategy for identifying and validating the signature? Okay. <laughs> You're up. How did how did they go through the discovery and then the validation and the testing? Okay, so then, so they got the RNA seq signature and then they went on to validating the other cohort. So did they stick with RNA seq? Yes. And then they also. Good. So they also adapted the signature to targeted proteomics. Why would they? I mean, targeted gene expression. Why would they do that? Why QRT instead of RNA seq? Um, pigment with um. QPCR, you have multiple genes that can be analyzed. <coughs> yeah, but you can say that for RNA-seq. RNA-seq, you can look at even more than quantitative. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It's cheaper. Mm -hmm. What else? Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's real-time PCR. But real-time just means you get uh, your gene expression on your curve immediately. Mm -hmm. But what is it about RT-QPCR? It's cheaper. Not cheaper, exactly. So it's cheaper, you can have targeted, obviously you're not going to be able to look at thousands of transcripts with um, QRT-PCR. It's just too expensive and it's not high throughput like that. So you develop it on a broad scale. Remember we always talk about discovery, you're looking at thousands and thousands of molecules and eventually you try and narrow it in. So with the QRT-PCR, that's a cheaper assay, it's done more routinely in labs, so they want to make sure the gene signature matches a targeted test, essentially. Okay, so then they validated it on the ACS, so they had their test set. And then they also validated, so they did blind validation. What does it mean to do blind validation? Yeah. Pardon? At random. Sorry, I didn't hear that. At random. Yeah, right? And also they don't know who is progressing and who is healthy. Okay, so usually in studies like this, big clinical trials, you're, the scientists are blinded. Okay, and then they did their blind validation with their progressors and their latent TB controls, and then they also validated on the GC6, so they had two validation cohorts. Okay, so let's talk about the RNA-seq analysis. Who's going to go through this? Okay, let's go. Well, the RNA extraction. Uh-huh. What's a, what is the PAX gene tube? Isn't <laughs> the kit? Uh, yeah, so the PAX gene tube is when you go draw blood, they, you know, have you guys ever seen they take like a little, little purple one and a green one or whatever? So each one of those is used for a different assay, so it has stabilizing reagents inside the tube. So this just has RNA stabilizing a, um, agents inside the tube. All right? I don't know what uh, globin transcript depletion is. Does anyone want to go through that? Globin transcript? Anyone look at that? Is it when you deplete... Um some um, uh, you have your RNA extraction, so then you deplete it so that you can be able to make copy DNA from that. Yeah, excellent. You need to deplete your highly abundant species, and we did touch oh, on that last yeah. time. So, globid transcripts, um, they're oxygen carrying part of the oxygen carrying molecule, right? And they are highly, highly abundant in the blood, especially here because we're looking at whole blood. So, it's not PBMCs, peripheral blood mononucleosides. So they had to deplete all the globin out of it. So what's the problem with depletion? What can be one of the problems that happens when you deplete? Yeah, right, so you, you, could, you could influence your quantitative results, but you can also non-specifically deplete. So other things might stick and then also get depleted out, which can skew your results. That's one of the problems. All right, so then what do they do? And then after they remove uh, excess uh, proteins, they converted the um, extracted RNA to cDNA. Good, yeah. And they 
Mm-hmm. They sequenced it using the Illumina, mm-hmm. I see, mm-hmm. the way they found. I don't know, is that what they found or is what the, there was the, the Illumina gives off? Yeah, that's just the depth of reading that they did. So they did get 30 million and 50 pace, pay and read. What is a pay and read? <laughs> yeah, right? Do you want to go for it? Uh, and the <laughs> so it sequences in both directions of your transcripts, which gives you much better coverage, much better surety than what you found is actually true. Okay? Uh, and then they found um, a match to the human genome. Right, yeah, they aligned it to the human genome. So it was the HG18 genome. What is HG18? Can anyone look that up? So databases are constantly updated. So first you start with AG1, which is the first database of the human genome. And as we do more, like the human genome project and things, so they're updated. So it's the 18th version of the human genome, right? Yeah. And then they looked at gene expression abundances. Good, Good job. <laughs> okay, so then they did, they came up with this risk signature. Who is the lucky one? Because this will be... <laughs> and don't worry, we're not getting into like the nitty gritty of this because that's not the point of this okay. exercise. So just tell us generally how they came up with the signature, and you can just read it. Yeah, so didn't they use a schooling system and then they identify genes that could lead to you having. But what do they do? They looked at pairs, right? Uh, didn't they look at interactions between genes as well? Yeah, so then they did pair matching, right? But they looked at the expression, so why is it good to look at two instead of one? Um, are there multiple genes responsible for this? Um, exactly. You're going to always get better discrimination with two genes instead of one. Yeah. Okay, and then? Um, what more is there to say? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, to see like yeah. which ones are more likely to... Okay, all right. And then they did model modeling and they tried to filter it for better predictive accuracy. And then finally they came up with a set of genes. Yeah, how many? Yes. So then they finally, after all of this effort, right, 16 genes. Which really shows you how like frustrating biomarker development can be because you span thousands and thousands of genes and only 16 in the end. But that's good. You don't want to have a huge signature that you need to measure. That's also becomes quite expensive. So they came up with the signature that they think is going to have good predictive value. Excellent, thank you. What was this? What happened in this figure? Okay, who did you pick? Robin. Good. I think when it was read, it went into the active stage yeah. while it was green. It means they're still was, healthy. Still Good. Healthy. Mm-hmm. But that's okay, so I'll go through it because it is actually mildly a bit weird that they did this, right? So this was the initial design. So they had everyone at zero and then they did 180. Those are the time points. But everyone progressed slightly differently, right? Some people uh, became mm-hmm. diseased earlier than others. So you can see that the time to diagnosis shifts. So what they decided to do, because they want to know, from the point that you develop TB, how many days behind can we predict that a patient is going to develop? So they decided to realign everything to time to diagnosis, instead of baseline, right? So it's just shifting that time point, so that they can say, at this time point, if we measure this patient 180 days, 360 days before they develop disease, How likely are we able to predict that they can develop tuberculosis? So it was just reshifting, not the time points, but essentially the final end point from baseline to time to diagnosis. So it was a bit weird, this figure, and at first I was just like, what is this? But that's all it means. So they line the time points to TB diagnosis, 
and then went on to say, if we measure 50 days, 100 days, 180, two years before they, be they get TB, we can predict this. All right, so this is adaptation to RTQPCR. We won't do this one, it's too easy. They, it's a targeted affordable strategy. They designed their primers, matching the splice junction. They used microfluidix, and then they validated it on the test OCS. Okay, we already discussed that. So what is figure 3A? <laughs> it's already written up there. You just need to read it. Okay. So if we look at the time, that was perfect. <laughs> so if we look at our progressors, right, this is the long, so we have our controls at the top. And what's our control expression showing? Right, there is no expression. Right, it's, it's neutral. And this is quite a lot of days before, and then this is getting increasingly closer to time to diagnosis. So what does this signature show us? What is red on our gene signature, on our heat map? Right, is increased. So what we can see is time to diagnosis increase. As we get closer to the moment that they are going to have active TB, we can see that the, the signature increases quite strongly, actually. But is this surprising? No. Why not? Right. When you expect that the moment just before you're diagnosed, your signature is probably super up, right? And then like further away, it diminishes and doesn't become as good. So this is not entirely surprising, but I think it's a really nice figure that shows just how strong the signature becomes the closer you become to diagnosis. Uh, was this image generated after they identified those uh, Yeah, so they developed the signature and then they went back and then just modeled or did the gene heat map. Yeah. Okay, so this is only on the patients that they know are going to... Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's not a truly retrospective study, it's still prospective, because they want to be able to prospectively show people, but they had already... So, much English. <laughs> <laughs> so does everyone know the difference between retrospective and prospective? No. So when you do a retrospective study, you already have the samples banked. So you already know the outcomes of those patients. So you go back, you have all these in the freezer, and you go back and you test them. Prospectively is you don't know what the outcome is going to be of these patients. You're going to be taking samples and looking for gene expression, say for example, and seeing if you can figure out what's happening. So retrospectively is in the past, right? Prospectively is in the future. So this was a mildly prospective because they didn't know who was going to go into progress, but then they based their signature knowing the outcome. So in a way it becomes a retrospective signature. Yeah. Does that make sense? I don't know if I explained that. Okay, so that just shows how the gene expression signature becomes much stronger the closer we are to diagnosis. What was this? Will this signature like reach all the time and then just not the Sorry, say that again with the signature? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like the signature increases the closer you get to yeah. the diagnosis. Yeah. So mm -hmm. will it reach at like a certain point for uh, a very high signature and it just goes off? Yeah, and I guess that's when the patient is so sick, probably the signature stays for a long time even when the patient's being treated. And I think they're busy retesting the signature now showing um, patient treatment and does the signature go back down as the patient becomes healthy again. But yeah, it would reach kind of this like high point, but by that stage if you're the scientist you would say, okay, well this patient has got a strong signature, let's start treating him retrospectively. Yeah. Okay, who is explaining figure 3B? Another. <laughs> and this was already kind of explained, so you don't have to go too crazy. Uh, that's really okay, so, <laughs> uh, so they generated the TB risk uh, signature by assessing multiple gene uh, interactions. Right, so we talked and about that, they were testing gene pairs together yeah. and if they discriminate nicely. So the other part in this diagram shows normalized expression of one gene protected against the other. And then... So explain to us what's going on in the scatter plot, what is it? Um, what's each one of these dots? Uh, they don't represent controls and progressives. Yeah, right. So controls are in black, progressives are in red. Mm -hmm. And what's each dot? 
it's a person, right? It's a patient. And so they've mapped the expression of one gene to another. And so what does this show us? What are these dotted lines? Anyone else can also help. Right, that's where they decide the kind of cut-off for this gene pair, for this gene pair, for this gene pair. For this gene pair, this is the cut-off that discriminates the progressors that are all kind of scattering above it to the controls. And it's the same thing for each of those. So you can see some of them, I mean, would you say this is a nice one? Yeah. No, so this isn't too great, right? Yeah. But in fact, for gene risk signatures that are predicting something from far away, this is not a terrible um, outcome, actually. When I first saw this paper, I was like, ugh, this is not very good. Especially, like, if you look at their specificity and their sensitivity, it wasn't, like, great. Mm -hmm. But um, I spoke to a few of the epidemiologists who were like, this is excellent. This is, like, the best that anyone's ever come up with. But essentially, this just shows you that there is a cutoff. And based on, if you measure this person and this ratio of this ratio to each other, based on that ratio, you can say, oh, this person is at risk of progressing. Okay, good job. Okay, this one. So someone can do three C and D and someone can do E and F. So you guys are experts in rock curves now because you've had these lectures. So you probably more than I do. I'm going to get this thing. No. I want this. Yeah, it's starting to not <laughs> <laughs> so just tell us about C and D. Right, so you can just read the first line, it's going to guide you into it. Nice I mean, and so, uh, at our curves, depicting um, you think the values of TBDS signatures in A is equal to C. Right, okay, and then what are the different colored lines on that C? Um, the days. Right, so they kind of stratified based on when they realigned their time points, so 0 to 180, 360 to 450, and then greater than 720 days. So what happens to the signature based on your rock curve as time changes, which is the same as the heat map? So it's basically decreasing. Right, yeah. So definitely 0 to 160 has the best sensitivity and specificity. And then they show the, the area under the curve and all of their values under here showing that the the signature really holds up quite well if you're measuring even up to 180 to 360 days. I mean, a year before the patient develops TB, you can say this patient is going to get TB. It's pretty impressive. Mm. So then what do they show us in D? What's D? I mean, it's right there. What's the dotted line? So, so what do they plot here? So this is the rock curve for the entire set showing RNA seq and QRT PCR. So what can we get from this? What does this show us? <laughs> good, right? Mm -hmm. They're very similar. So this is quite good because you know your targeted test holds up very well to the RNA seq, which is the most sensitive assay you can do. And so both signatures, based on the two different platforms, hold up very well to each other, right? It's not like all of a sudden your RTQPCR is very low. Okay, then what do they do with E and F? <laughs> I want to compare the South African and the Gambian samples to one another. Yep, yeah, good. So that's just all of GC6, and then they've got also the South African and the Gambia. And they match very well. It's not like the Gambia was very different or South Africa is very different. They all hold up quite nicely in terms of sensitivity and specificity. And then finally, what is F? It's just a time points, right? So they're just showing that if you're looking at the solid line, so up to a year, you have a pretty good predictive value using your gene signature. Okay. But these rock curves aren't the greatest, right? You ideally want like a perfect score, but they're not terrible. Um, what I think that they can do once you've, dis you've said, okay, well, you have a higher risk, then you take that person and you stratify them and you take them to hospital and maybe do further tests. So it shouldn't be a diagnostic test, but it's more to stratify patients to treat them. Okay. Can we go? 
So who wants to go through no. some of the final points of this paper? Discussions and conclusions. Who's left? Me. Me. Here we go. <laughs> and she's not so here. Hey, I'm going. Well, your name was first. You guys can do it together, right, as a team. <laughs> Alternate between words. Yes. Paul, Rod, G. Okay, so basically, what it wanted the paper wanted to say is that the whole blood gene signature identified for predicting the risk of tuberculosis disease progressed. Do we agree with that statement? <laughs> like, do you think they were successful? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think they were pretty successful. I think it wasn't bad, okay? Mm. And the signature validated and blinded sample from parent cohort, a new cohort, co cohort from SA and the Gambia, despite diversity. What does that mean? Right, so, so what does that mean? What are they saying there in that sentence? Right, so the signature val was validated blindly, right, on the blinded cohort. Sorry, is there a lecture? Sorry, Sorry, we're almost done. I'm looking for Ashbowl. No. 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 So they have the parent cohort, the new cohort, and so they were able to validate it in South African Gambia, despite the diversity of the sites, the population, and the age of the population, right? So they had this crazy diversity, even though the training set was not done on a very diverse population, right? Quite narrow range, and it still held up, okay? And it was quite, um, it was possible to predict risk of progression up to 18 months before TB disease manifests. So do you agree with that? Yeah. 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 18 months, yeah, I would say definitely a year. Year, they were super strong, then yeah. it stops. Getting a little bit. Okay, so you're off the hook, you're next. <laughs> <laughs> so they got a signature which is which they which allowed them to look at the disease compared to latent so the latent disease from other ones. Right, from other diseases and active disease. Yeah. So they could definitely tell the difference between the two, which is quite important, right? Yeah? Um, and these signature genes correlate with previous literature. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, that's always good if you match the literature. Um, and then the whole blood can then. What's the interferon response? Sorry? What's the interferon response? Oh. They implicate the interferon response. What is that? I don't know. Who's immunology here? Yeah, cytokines. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of cytokines and chemokines which are molecules in the body that signal immune cells to react or to attack or whatever. And so the interferon gamma response is quite an important pathway in tuberculosis. So it's quite nice that they were able to implicate this and this was what the signature was involved with. But it's not a unique signature to TB. Definitely if you have other sort of lung infections, your interferon gamma response will respond as well. Okay? Um, so they can use whole blood instead of blood? PBMCs, peripheral blood mononucleus blood cells. So PBMCs, does anyone know what PBMCs are? So they're just a special, the specific portion or population of cell types in the blood. So you have to do, most people like to work on PBMCs because they're more pure. You're not dealing with everything from the whole blood. But it's quite a process to isolate them. So why would it be better to use a whole blood signature? Because it's just quick and, quick and easy. And ideally we would like to develop a blood based test. So you can do a fingerprint test and do maybe a lateral flow assay. So most studies would like to just work with whole blood, but it gets messy. But I think they did quite well on a whole blood test. All right? General population. This can be then applied to the general population. Yeah. So there's actually a study that's going on now in the Western Cape called Screen TB, where they have developed a lateral flow test based on these signatures, and they are starting to validate patients and um, retrospectively treat them with anti-tuberculosis medication and see if that helps in curbing patients that are going to go on to develop TB. So it is based on the study and this is an ongoing trial that's happening. And we're done! Yay! Well done guys! <laughs>